good morning again. It is good to see you. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we begin today? Father, what a sweet time of worship it has been, and I pray we'll continue as we dive into your word. Lord, we have sung, Great is thy faithfulness, and we celebrate and rejoice in that truth. We have sung, How great thou art. Lord, we are not faithful, but you are. We are not great, but you are. Lord, we have sung, There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Lord, we thank you for those truths. And I pray that it has not just been our voices that have uttered or sung these words today, but that it has been our heart and our spirit that has been in them. Lord, that you have accepted them as worthy worship this morning. It reminds me of what the psalmist said in Psalms 138.5. And they will sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Great is your glory, Lord, and we pray that we as your disciples would be about the business of proclaiming that glory throughout the nations and the world, Lord, that we would be bold in our confession of you, our Lord. Thank you. We ask now that you would... Bless us as we dive back into this high and holy text in the book of Isaiah. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Isaiah 53, if you are got your Bibles or your tablets or whatever you're reading along with this morning, go ahead and turn or tap over to Isaiah 53. Last week we introduced this series called Against All Odds, and I, I began by giving you some predictions. Seven predictions. Do you remember them? Did you write them down? Okay, what was the first one? NFR winner in 2026. Somebody did write it down. That's good. I, man, that you, nobody in the first service wrote it down. <laughs> Hundreds of people were here, and people were, I was like, y'all didn't write it down? They didn't take me serious in the first service. Y'all are more spiritual. We know that. Second service people, <laughs> more spiritual people. We know this. Y'all taking notes. I like that. All right. Next one was, in 2025, at the ripe old age of 90, who's coming out of retirement? Elvis. He's coming out of retirement. That's right. He's going to play a sold-out show at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. My third prediction was that sometime in the next 10 years, our beloved pastor, Scotty Smith, He's going to write a book. Not any book, though. Nope, 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 nope. New York Times bestseller. And the title of it, I even predicted that. The Ins and Outs of Frisbee Golf, How to Become a Champion. (laughs) That will be the title of his book. That will be a New York Times bestseller. I also predicted that in November of 2029, a Category 4 hurricane is going to slam into New York City, do tremendous damage. My fifth one was that the Houston Texans are going to win the Super Bowl next year. (laughs) My sixth one was that in 2032, the Atascosa River will be named the top tourist destination for tubing in Texas. And number seven, my final prediction was that all four of my children would grow up to have four children of their own that each of them would have two boys and two girls. They would be perfectly balanced in every way. And that all eight of the boys would be as bald and good-looking as their grandpa. That was my prediction. So last week, after I made those seven predictions, I asked you, how many of you think one of those things will happen? We had two or three people raise their hands in both services, saying, yeah, I think one of those things might happen I said, how many of you think two of those things might happen, or three or four? No, nobody raised their hands for three or four of those things w- could happen. But what if I would keep going? What if I, I did another five or another 10? Or what if I did another 50 predictions? Or better yet, what if I made another 300 predictions? And then what if, against all odds, 
one by one, all 300 of those predictions came true, just like I said they would. I bet more people would listen to me. I bet I would have more followers on Facebook and YouTube, right? I bet we wouldn't be having church here. We'd have to have it at the AT&T Center, multiple services every Sunday. I bet you guys would come to me more often with, with adv wanting advice if I got 300 things like that right. So my question as we begin today is this, then why don't we listen to God? Why don't we prioritize Him? Why don't we honor Him? Why don't we worship Him? Why don't we respect Him? And perhaps most importantly, why don't we believe Him? There are over 300 predictions, prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. Some written hundreds, others thousands of years before he was ever born. And they all came true, and yet we don't take God at his word. You want to know how crazy the odds are for getting 300 predictions like this 100% correct? Me too. But the reality is you can't, you can't calculate it. The odds are so impossible, it cannot be calculated. Uh, someone has tried. There was a guy by the name of Peter Stoner. He was a mathematician. He specialized in probabilities. And he set out some years ago to discover what, what are the odds? What are the probabilities that Jesus Christ, in a 33-year lifespan, could fulfill all 300-plus of these prophecies or predictions about the Messiah in the Old Testament? Stoner spent a while doing this. He was a mathematician and a, a guy who dealt with predictions by trade, and so he had all the tools and all the experience to do it. Stoner's number of the odds for eight prophecies, not 300, but for eight of these things to come true about Jesus was 1 by 10 to the 17th power. That's a 1 with 17 zeros behind it. The English word for that is 100 quadrillion. Somebody once asked him, like, how do we wrap our mind around that? Like, can you give us an analogy? What would that look like? And he said, I got a perfect analogy for you. He said, imagine this, the state of Texas. How many of you all know where the state of Texas is? That's good because you're in it. If you didn't raise your hand, you pray for you. You're here. So the state of Texas is big, amen? You know, I love that sign over in Beaumont. It says, like, Beaumont, seven miles, El Paso, what is it, 897 miles or whatever, it's a lot. It's kind of like, you can get there from here, but probably not today, you know, it's <laughs> not going to happen, but it is that way. Texas is big. He said, take the state of Texas. How many of you know what a silver dollar is, the coin? He said, take the state of Texas and fill it up from border to border, two feet, not two inches, two feet deep with silver dollars. And then take one silver dollar, put a big red X on it, throw it back into the pile, get a bunch of bulldozers, mix all those coins up again, level it all out two feet deep, find a random person, put a blindfold on them, drop them in the middle of the state, spin them around, and tell them to walk as far and as long as they want, and then they have one chance to reach into the pile blindfolded and pull out that one silver dollar with an X on it. He said that is the probability that one man could fulfill eight of the prophecies about him in the Old Testament. Stoner did continue. He went on to 9 and 10 and 11 and 12. He finally got to 48 prophecies about Jesus and he stopped right there. The reason was, he said, the probability of one person being able to fulfill 48, we haven't gotten anywhere close to 300, 48 is 1 by 10 to the 157th power. That's a 1 followed by 157 zeros. The total number of atoms in the universe, not the world, but in the universe, is a 1 followed by 80 zeros. Now, I don't know who went around counting all the atoms. But I did look this up, and I saw it in multiple places. Some people said it's one with 78 zeros. Some said it's one with 80. Some said one with 82. But somewhere in that range. One with 157 zeros behind it is the probability that Jesus 
could fulfill just 48, less than 50 of the 300 prophecies. There's literally no way to calculate the odds that Jesus was able to fulfill every single prediction about him in 33 years on this planet. Last week, we looked at the last one in chapter 53. Today, we're going to look at the first one, first two verses um, about it. I don't know why the Lord wanted us to go in that order. I just felt prompted by the Spirit to, to do it in this order. And here's what it says, 53, 1 and 2. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, and no appearance that we should desire him. Can I just tell you of all the prophecy about Jesus, all the prophecy here in in chapter 53 about Jesus, this is the one nobody really talks about that much. It, It doesn't seem on the surface like we have that much to gain from it. But I believe we do if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. There's one thing I've learned in following the Lord for a number of decades now. It's this. We should always expect the unexpected. When it comes to God, you should always expect the unexpected. That's the big idea. Anybody uh, here believe that? Have you seen that in your own life? When it comes to the Lord, expect the unexpected. Is it just me? You've noticed too, right? With God, it seems like no matter what I expect, almost always, it's the unexpected that actually happens. There's three things here in this text that are unexpected, and I believe they're extremely important. The first one is this. We see an unexpected forecast about Christ, an unexpected forecast about Jesus. Did you see how verse 1 started? There are two questions presented. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom... Has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In other words, this is so marvelous, this is so mysterious, this is so magnificent, so mystifying, so mind-blowing, nobody's going to believe it. It is, by all accounts and standards, an unexpected forecast that is to come. But with God, you better expect the unexpected. Just a few chapters later in Isaiah 55, the Lord said this, For as heaven, this is verse 9 of 55, For as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, it might not always make sense to you. As smart and wise as you are, as well educated as you might be, God is smarter, God is wiser, and he's got more education than you. As much wisdom as you may perceive that you have, or your daddy has, or your preacher has, or somebody else has, it doesn't even compare. It's not, it's not even comparable in any kind of meaningful or significant way as to the wisdom of the Lord. Because his ways are indeed higher than ours, as are his thoughts. So we better expect the unexpected. Paul was speaking of spiritual wisdom in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And what did Paul say there in verse 6? He says, we do, however, speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom In a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom, because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived, God has prepared these things for those who love him. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no heart has even been able to conceive it. You better expect the unexpected. The psalmist said it like this in Psalms 40, verse 5, Lord my God, you have done many things. Your wondrous works and your plans for us, none can compare with you. If I were to report and speak of them, they are more than can be told. Because with God, we had better expect the unexpected. The two questions that chapter 53 begins with are based on the context from chapter 52. 
When Isaiah penned these words, he didn't put chapter and verse like we have it here. So we have to back up and say, what is he talking about? When he says, who has believed what we have heard and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He's referring to what was previously said back in the previous chapter. We won't go all the way back to grab all of the context. But let us just go to chapter 52, verse 13 for some of the context. Here's what it says there. See, my servant will be successful. He will be raised and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured, he did not look like a man, and his form did not resemble a human being. So he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him, for they will see what had not been told them, and they will understand what they had not heard. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This forecast is not what you expect. Isaiah predicted that people would be appalled at the Messiah. You don't expect that, right? He predicted that the Messiah would be disfigured to the point that he wouldn't even be recognizable as a human being. That's not the expected forecast when it comes to the Son of God. It's not the expected forecast when it comes to the Messiah of the world. This isn't what you expect the story to look like. It's not how it's supposed to go. This isn't how I picture it going down. Not in my head. So who indeed can believe that? It's why I keep telling you with the Lord, you better expect the unexpected. Even the arrival of Jesus wasn't expected He was born not in a palace, not even in a Motel 6. There was no room in the inn. He was born in a stable. The most humble of circumstances, that's not what you expect. The life of Christ didn't go as you might expect. He was tried and tested. They tried to trick him at every step of the way. He was tempted by the devil. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the other legalistic religious people of the day did everything they could to turn people against him he would cast demons out of people and then be run out of town people thought he was crazy and had lost his mind the life of Christ the ministry of Christ didn't go as you might expect the death of Christ certainly was not expected I mean everyone was shocked everyone was indeed appalled Even the disciples who should have known better because Jesus himself had forecast and foretold that he would die. They were surprised when he said it is finished. Even the mother of Jesus who got a visit from an angel before Jesus was ever even born and said, hey, you're carrying the son of God. And here's his purpose. She didn't expect this. Not only to be visited from the angel, but she didn't expect it to end the way it did. Just like the meteorologists of our time seem to get it wrong more than they get it right, all of the forecasters, religious forecasters, concerning the life of Christ, the Messiah of the world, got it wrong too. You want to know why? Because they thought they had figured God out. They thought they knew better. They thought they were wiser. They thought they were smarter. They thought they were ready. They had totally forgotten that with the Lord you better expect the unexpected. Can I tell you there are a lot of people in our time, in our day, living in this hour, in this generation, even breathing the oxygen in this very room who think they have figured God out. That is a dangerous place to be because with the Lord you better expect the unexpected. We see something else unexpected in our text. We see an unexpected foundation, not just an unexpected forecast, An unexpected foundation. Jesus would not arrive here on this planet in the way that you might expect the Son of God to arrive. And some 700 years before it ever happened, Isaiah called it. He nailed it. The Spirit moved inside of him in a way that allowed him to see it or at the very least sense it with such certainty that it caused him to declare it and to pin it and write it down. And it makes no sense unless you know God so well that you expect the unexpected. Here's what it says in Isaiah 53, verse 2. 
he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. This is not what you expect. In so many ways, this is unexpected. I mean, think about it. Here, Isaiah is saying that he will be like a young plant. And he's going to sprout out of dry ground. It makes no sense. I mean, I would expect something like, he will be a mighty oak. Or he will be like a 2,000-year-old a olive tree whose fruit continues to bless people. I would expect something that symbolizes power and strength. I would expect something that symbolizes dignity and honor. I would, I would expect something that symbolizes majesty and grandness, nobility. But the Hebrew word here means young plant, sapling, or tender shoot. It's exactly the opposite of what you would expect. A tender shoot in dry ground is fragile. A tender shoot in dry ground is likely to fail. A tender shoot in dry ground is flimsy, and in many ways it is awkward and undignified. But this was God's plan, because with the Lord you can always expect the unexpected. The dry ground mentioned here in our text is also significant. He grew up before him like a young plant, a tender shoot, and like the root out of a dry ground. We can't be for certain what this refers to. Maybe here the dry ground is referring to the poor, poverty-stricken family that Jesus would be born into. He wasn't born the son of a king or a prince. He wasn't even born the son of an oil tycoon. He, he wasn't born into middle class. He was born into poverty, son of a carpenter. Maybe it's a reference to the spiritual health of the culture he would encounter while he walked among us. Maybe it's a, a spiritual reference to the spiritual health of the newish Jewish nation which would fight against him the entire way. Whatever the picture is clear, this won't be an easy road to hoe, as they say. This is going to be tough. He's a tender shoot coming up out of dry ground. The odds are stacked against him. They're not in his favor from the very start. And that's just not really what you expect, is it? But again, with the Lord, you've got to always expect the unexpected. Isaiah mentions this foundation from which Jesus would come in other places, like Isaiah 11, verse 1, where it says, Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Even in this, we see that with God, you can always expect the unexpected. You might remember or recall that Jesse was the father of King David. Do you remember how David was selected as king in the very first place? That's right, you better expect the unexpected. Samuel was given some instruction to go and anoint the new king. And here's what it says in 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or his stature, because I have rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. In other words, Samuel, don't think the first person you see who looks the part is the guy. you got to expect the unexpected when you show up at Jesse's house. So Samuel makes the journey. He goes to Jesse's house. He takes a look at all the boys. He says, hey, Jesse, uh, hey, bring me your boys. i got to take a look at them. Jesse says, sure, great. Man, Prophet Samuel's here. You bet. He brings all the boys in. Samuel takes a look at all of them. He goes, nah, it's none of these. You got any more boys? Because I know God told me to come to your house. But God's saying it's none of these. There's got to be more, right? Did I hear God wrong? You know, who knows what Samuel's thinking here. And Jesse says, well, you know, there is one more. Kind of the run of the litter, though. I mean, he's the baby. You wouldn't want the baby. He's the youngest. He's out with the sheep. A little bit awkward kind of a kid. Probably not the one you want. And Samuel's like, well, I don't know. It's none of these. Bring him here. And here's what it says in verse 12. So Jesse sent for him. He had beautiful eyes and a healthy, handsome appearance. And then the Lord said, anoint him, for he is the one. 
So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. I'm sure that made them happy. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David from that day forward. This isn't how it's supposed to happen. This isn't what you expect. It's supposed to be the oldest brother who gets picked. Maybe the strongest brother is supposed to get picked. Maybe it's the one that's the best looking that's supposed to get picked. The most charismatic, the best speaker of the bunch. But you sure don't expect it to be the baby. I'm telling you with the Lord, you better expect the unexpected. When we look at the family tree of Jesus, one of the best places to look at that, where it's kind of all compiled for us, is in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. When you go through the genealogy of Jesus, when you look at his family tree, you don't find what you expect there. Anybody looked at your family tree and go, ooh, I didn't expect that. (laughs) You had that experience? Uh, Check out Matthew chapter 1. You'll have that experience all over again for Jesus. You're like, man, this is kind of an unexpected family foundation for the Savior of the world. Now, that family foundation, that family tree, yeah, it includes Jesse and David, but there are many others. There is, for example, a a woman by the name of Tamar. You can read her story in Genesis chapter 38. Her first husband was so evil that the Lord killed him. I mean, you got to be pretty bad for the Lord to take you out. Says the Lord killed him. He was so bad. So she was left a widow, and as was the custom of the day, she got hooked up with her husband's brother, her brother in law. Ooh, I know all the ladies are like, oh, that's icky. <laughs> Thinking about your brother in law, like, oh man. Well, that's, that's the way it happened. She gets hooked up with the brother in law, but he's even a bigger jerk. And so God takes him out too. She's left as a widow again. So she dresses up as a temple prostitute and puts herself in the path of her father-in-law. It's ickier than even before because apparently she knew that he was such a low life. He wasn't going to be able to control his sexual temptations, and she's right. So she ends up getting pregnant by her father-in-law. She keeps some of his stuff, and she blackmails him. I mean, this is like Jerry Springer Old Testament style. It's messed up. It is is really messed up stuff. It's juicy, y'all. Go read it. Genesis 38. Right there in Jesus' family tree is that lady. And then you have Rahab. I mean, Rahab, she's a prostitute, professional prostitute, living in the city of Jericho when God's people show up. For whatever reason, God gave her eyes to see and ears to hear, and she helps God's people. She's ultimately saved. But she was a prostitute. And there she is in the family tree of Jesus. She becomes the mother of Boaz, who married Ruth, who was the great-great-grandmother of David. But she started as a prostitute. While we're talking about it, let's deal with Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. I know for a lot of you that doesn't mean anything, but it means something for sure. Because you see, that means Ruth's family tree doesn't go back to Abraham like you might expect. Her family tree goes back to to Lot. So you're not supposed to be in this family tree. It's not how this is supposed to look. It's unexpected. She too was left vulnerable as a a widow before she becomes the wife of Boaz in a totally unexpected way. And trust me when I say I'm not just picking on the ladies. There's some really messed up dudes in this family tree too. You got Jacob. Man, that guy was a schemer and a liar. He was so sorry he stole the blessing from his brother. We know David committed adultery and murder. We could go on and on about these people, I mean, but it's, it's a jacked up family tree. It's not the perfect picture you might expect for the Son of God to be born into. I love the way Nancy Guthrie wrote about the family tree of Jesus. She said, Jesus came from a long line of outsiders, outlaws, scoundrels, and sinners. That pretty much sums it up. When he entered into the world, he entered into the messiness 
of the human family. Anybody else got a messy family? Jesus knows. Even in his own family, it was messy. In fact, he was the only member of his family who never brought shame upon the family. Instead, he took it upon himself, the shame of every person, even in his family tree. The point is, this isn't the foundation you expect for the Son of God. And as I've been telling you with God, you can always expect the unexpected. And 700 years before Jesus was ever born, Isaiah penned those words about this foundation and says, hey, it's not going to be what you think. There's a third and final thing. We'll deal with it quickly. It's the unexpected form. Verse 2 seems really strange, really out of place, and really unexpected here at the end. It says he didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him. No appearance that we should desire him. In other words, whatever you might think and whatever artists might might try to portray to you or, or, or whatever people might tell you, Jesus wasn't a hunk. He wasn't the stud muffin everybody wanted a selfie with. He, he, he wasn't going to have the looks of, you know, somebody that you just go, man, that guy's got all the right stuff. He wasn't a perfect person. Been hearing a lot about AI lately. AI is becoming a big thing. I saw a thing just this week. I thought about putting it up on the screen for you, but I, I didn't want to um, give you a false picture of who Jesus is and burn that in your head. But what, an AI computer just this week produced a selfie of Jesus and his disciples. It said if, if Jesus and his disciples had had a way to take a selfie, this is what they would have looked like. The computer put it all together. But you know, the funny thing was they were all perfect people had perfect features, they were perfectly, you know, everything was perfectly symmetrical, their eyes were perfect, Jesus had this perfect hair, he had a perfect beard, it looked like he put some beard oil in it that morning or something, it was all, you know, perfect. It's like just everything about the picture was perfect. Now you can believe AI if you want, I tend to believe Isaiah and the Word of God that says he didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. In other words, he's not what you would expect. Again, in a world that puts so much value on looks, God shows us that it's what's on the inside that really matters more than what's on the outside. It also shows us once again that with God, you can always expect the unexpected. There's also an unexpected finish to it all. Some of you are, are saying, well, I mean, what's the point? I mean, I, I, see, I see what you're saying, but what does this have to do with me? What does it have to do with my neighbor? What does it have to do with my coworkers, my spouse, my kids? What, what is the point? Some of you are thinking, I don't expect that God cares very much about me, or I don't expect that God can save someone like me, or I don't expect that God would want someone like me and his family. I don't expect that Jesus can wash my sins away. You don't know what I've done, where I've been, how I've done it, or who I've done it with. I don't think God can cure my sickness or my disease. I don't expect God will ever forgive me. Some of you might even be thinking, I don't expect I'm welcome at this church. Some of you that are watching online probably aren't going to church because you think you're not welcome there. You might even go so far as to say, I don't expect I'm welcomed in the family of God itself. Well, if you're thinking anything like that, you haven't been listening, so let me try one more time. With God, you always expect the unexpected. (laughs) Jesus said from the cross, he said, it is finished. As he died for your sins and for mine. There was a lot of things that weren't expected on that day and that time. I promise you, Pilate did not expect Jesus to be silent and to stand there in silence as he faced the charges they had brought against him. Who stands in silence when they're falsely accused? Totally unexpected. The executioner didn't expect Jesus to lay down 
and not fight and scream and cry and moan like everybody else he had ever tacked to the wood did. That thief who hung next to him didn't expect to be in paradise that day. That soldier who had cast lots for his clothing didn't expect to confess him as Lord when the earth went dark and the ground began to shake beneath his feet. And he said, surely this was the Son of God. The disciples didn't expect Jesus to die on the cross. They thought he was going to be a conquering king. They were expecting the armies of heaven to dive down out of the sky and save everything and make everything right. But he did breathe his last on that day. Totally unexpected. The chief priests and the Pharisees did not expect that the curtain in the temple would be split. Joseph didn't expect that Jesus would be laid in a tomb he had cut for himself. And I can promise you, nobody expected him to come walking out of the grave three days later. With God, you better expect the unexpected. The reality is this, he does love you. He is for you. He did die for you. He does care about you. He will forgive you. He does accept you just as you are. Whether you expect it or not has nothing to do with it. In fact, if you don't expect it, it probably means it's the way God planned it. Because with God, you better expect the unexpected. Let's pray. If you are here today or can hear my voice and have not given your life to the Lord, we give you an opportunity in this moment to repent of your sins, to call on Jesus, to confess that He is indeed your Lord and Savior. We don't ask you to rise. We don't ask you to raise a hand. We don't ask you to walk an aisle. We just ask you to pray with us. Wherever you are, even if you're just listening, you just pray with me. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent of those sins. and Lord, I give my life to you today. I ask that you would forgive me, that you would cleanse me, Lord, that you would make me new. I thank you for your grace and your goodness. I thank you for meeting me here today in the most unexpected way. Lord, as we close this morning, we are grateful. We are grateful indeed for the reality that it doesn't always happen the way we think it should we are grateful for the cross for the savior who bore our sins Lord we're grateful for the breath you have implanted in our lungs and the energy you have produced inside of our hearts even in this moment to continue to live may we harness it all for your glory so we can continue to sing both with our lips and our voices, but more importantly with our lives, how great thou art, great is thy faithfulness. And that we could continue to proclaim that there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Oh Lord, we love you. And we thank you for impressing us in the most unexpected ways. I ask your blessing now on these who are here and these who can hear my voice, Lord. May you bless them and their families in the name of Jesus.